meaning this is our land, we have to take care of everything that belongs to us. So when we say that, it's, uh, it's like a statement of our Aboriginal rights and title. The second part of that statement is our obligations to take care of everything that belongs to us. Governance is, is an important part of treaty uh, making. The, uh, the, the whole issue surrounding uh, the need to, to, to provide to the community members what they need to have in order to, to govern themselves properly. There's a number of challenges that we've experienced with respect to governance. Uh, first of all, getting rid of the confusion surrounding what actually governance is. Uh, the Stalo Nation, uh, as an example, uh, it provides services to the community members and too often people have come to believe that services are governance and, and, and quite, quite to the contrary. Uh, service delivery is a product of governance. Uh, governance is actually the, the, the whole um, being uh, and um, delivery of policies uh, that the programs uh, can, can operate under, that are implemented under. Self-government has been added as an essential component of the treaty, which then would be also protected like the main treaty in Section 35 of the Constitution. So the First Nation ends up from beginning uh, uh, under the Indian Act as a ward of the government, as essentially um, uh, following the discretion of the Ministry of Indian Affairs, moving into a fully self-governing unit that is able to tax its own people, it's able to make its own laws and jurisdiction according to the treaty, and is able to operate as another level of government in Canada under the Canadian Constitution. Self-governance will be more autonomous in that we won't be under the regime of the Department of Indian Affairs laws and regulations we won't necessarily be under the laws and regulations of the government at large. We will have the freedom to determine how we want to govern in our communities and what our relationships will look like with the other surrounding communities. Every community has different uh, means of um, needs that they have in their own communities. And um, I think the best thing though is it gives them the power of the ability to achieve utilizing their own community members or, or at least challenging themselves to find their own means of um, their, their conducting their business for, for their future. At this point, uh, the governments hold all that. I think uh, it really is going to put a big uh, check mark on a lot of our leadership to challenge them to really what it's going to take to be self-governing for their own people and, and accept the challenge that it takes to be at that level of um, taking care of your communities as, as a whole. That means going out and finding funding, um, uh, finding opportunities that you're going to bring in, hopefully the, uh, the investors that are out there that we can bring to our communities. Self-governance for our community members will allow them to have a voice where they don't necessarily have a voice in the structures that we currently have with chiefs and councils being the ones that are presumed to be in charge. It needs to be more of a, a community-based structure that starts with our communities and what their needs are and not necessarily what the chiefs and councils think our membership needs. The, the whole notion and another mindset that has created a lot of problems for, for First Nation is this, is this term self-government. Uh, to me and many others, uh, there's a suggestion that uh, self-government uh, means something that's delegated or allocated or permitted under a, a, a dominant government and or a senior government. Uh, you don't refer to BC as being self-governing. You don't refer to Canada as being self-governing. You don't even refer to municipalities as self-governing. And so it's a term that uh, in some respects is, is offensive. It's something again that that needs to change uh, when it comes to uh, the mindsets that exist. Um, I feel that uh, uh, as long as we continue to use the terms, um, it'll be very difficult to, uh, to re-educate our people that uh, we're setting up governing structures. 
and we shouldn't refer to self-government um, forever. Uh, it, it, it's a term that uh, where we need to govern ourselves, period. Stolo community governance can better decide what is the best interest of the people as they're walking the same path. Being a ward of the Crown has its benefits, but more so it has negative aspects to it. Any activity that involves the Department of Indian Affairs takes more time to evolve than if the process was more community, nation-driven. Through the past uh, issues that the government put forward, you know, is to ban all of these things, similar to the potlatch law, you know, where in the residential school, you know, they try to assimilate us, you know, and they haven't done it, but they've created a lot of problems for our for the grandchildren of all those people that were in residential schools. The treaty process, which, you know, even the term treaty itself, if I, if I delve deeper, is that it, it's not just a treaty. We're developing a relationship with the, the, the non-Aboriginal people. It's important in a, in a relationship that the, the non-Aboriginal people respect, understand, and support the, the Stalo uh, in their traditions, in their cultures, in their activities, and understand the importance that governance plays in that role. We are taking away the power from the government. We're at a very dangerous point that in our, um, in our structure of um, our political position with the governments at this point, because they have the power to change anything at will. If they want to uh, change a bill, they just put another one together and they bring it to their house and they, they can uh, change anything they want because they have that power. As I get more involved with the Department of Indian Affairs and their governance structure, it's obvious that they do not have the same principles of First Nations. They have decision making that is behind doors and non-inclusive. At this point, it's only one-sided. They have all the power to make the changes that they can and will today. So the treaty benefits are that we have more control over our own destiny. The treaty is going to give us an opportunity to move out from the shadow or out from under the thumb of the government and allow us to, to demonstrate to people that, uh, that we have ambitions and goals and we can, we can take care of those aspirations on our own. And that's one of the things, unfortunately, that the Indian Act has done is it suffocated our aspirations and left many communities uh, in a lurch when it comes to desire to build capacity. Governance that is established by non-Aboriginal governments are, are doomed to fail because they don't reflect and respect the importance of peoples choosing their leaders in a way that has been accepted through the years, through history. It, it's not necessarily going back uh, in time and adopting or resurrecting uh, governing structures that existed prior to colonialism. It's, it's more respecting the, the importance of tradition and culture because that is uh, deep inside what makes people style, what makes them Aboriginal. And having that incorporated into uh, the governance. When you take a look at these, these stone figures as a collection, what's interesting about them is that they represent particular rules or values. And um, uh, so part of what I thought was our constitution is, is laws, rules of behavior. And you always hear the expression, well, rules aren't written in stone. Well, these ones are, <laughs> interestingly enough. Um, the creator, in his, in his wisdom, uh, decided to to take certain uh, people and make an example out of them. And so throughout the nation, you have these stone figures which represent rules or values that we have actually now in stone. And our, our constitution has always been here then. Our rules of conduct, our rules of behavior, and the way that we think our moral values. And they actually situated around the stone nation. And they not only define our nation, but they define how we're supposed to conduct ourselves. We come work together like we have in, in the treaty table, different communities. You know, the stronger we, we get with the different communities, the better off we'll be. You know, we, we look after, you know, 
our treaty negotiator right now is after the uh, guardianship program of the, uh, the Fraser River. You know, they're looking after the salmon runs and taking care of the census and all that and issuing permits, you know, for harvesting. You know, we want that right ourselves, not run by other governments. When we have a government, you know, we look after everything. And that's what, uh, really what we're after in a treaty, you know, because uh, a lot of the Serbian news gets to us, you know, and it's kind of too late to act on. So we want to nip everything in the bud and look after all the issues ourselves. I feel that uh, terminology such as self-government, those things have to start to fade away because I think it's important that we talk about Stalo government, Stalo Kukwilma government, and developing the terms and conditions uh, for uh, developing policy, developing law, uh, so that the service delivery agencies uh, in our communities can operate in, in a way that is going to be acceptable to, uh, to our people. Changing the whole idea uh, around, you know, and, and, and clearly articulating the difference between government and service delivery because those things have been meshed together uh, far too much with uh, the current chief and council structure, the current tribal council structures, and I, we need to, to, to show the world that, uh, that, that, that we have the ability to, to govern ourselves and to develop the institutions that are going to deliver services to our community members. Ooh.